your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. This is the Atheist Manifesto. Dear friends, and welcome to the Gaithies Manifesto. I am your host, Callie Wright, joined once again by the indefatigable doggo Maddie and totally legitimate queer and trans person, Ari Stillman. What's up, Ari? Thank you for the validation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, those are like two really important things in your life right now, so. That's true. I learned the most hilarious thing, and I want to get your reaction to this on air, okay? Yeah. We're doing it. So, um, so AGDQ is happening. It's, it's the speed running competition. It stands for awesome games done quick. And it's like this charity video game speed running competition where people watch the stream and donate money. Right. And, um, uh, apparently, uh, gamers are a little upset about it this year because they've gotten a little stricter on non-discrimination and, uh, they let trans people do it and stuff. And oh my god I, I found out i found out from zach that people on 4chan are complaining that trans people can't be good speedrunners because they have to take too many dilation breaks are you fucking serious <laughs> it oh has to be god. a joke like that has to be i really hope that's a joke i'm like okay if you hate trans people so much why do you even know about that i was gonna say is like the hormones and testosterone argument a thing with video games too like yeah, like testosterone gives you an unfair advantage in, in punching uh, buttons and people are complaining oh we're not allowed to have fun at agdq this year because we can't use trans slurs oh so apparently God. this is a problem that's not just happening in the atheist community it's happening in the gaming community as well oh i mean that's kind of everywhere let's just be honest like but apparently a bunch of like speedrunners are coming out as trans left and right and it's like wow a lot of trans people are nerds nobody knew that right well i was gonna say also a lot of trans <laughs> people are fast at things so that's it's almost like they're a diverse <laughs> group of people with their own interests and talents and it's it's weird so <laughs> <laughs> that just makes the transition into the episode so weird, but we're going to do it anyway. So I knew this lady at a support group I used to go to, and this support group was my lifeline when I was first figuring out who I was and the coming out process and everything. And uh, this one time in a meeting, we ended up being the only two people there. I think it was, at a, I think it was a holiday or something like that, but uh, I wasn't out at work. So most of the time... I didn't have time to change clothes or shave or clean up or anything before I went. Like most of the time it was just like gross t-shirt, gym shorts, non-shaved. Like this was pre everything as far as transition goes. And so I ended up uh, it just me and her at the table at the support group meeting. And we sat and talked for a while. And as we got up to leave, we hugged. And as I pulled away, she looked at my face and goes, maybe shave closer next time. And that's like a knife directly into dysphoria center number one for me at the time. It made me feel like utter shit. And this is the same lady who later on would offer me a place to stay when I was having problems with my grandma, but laughed when the inclusion of non-binary people was brought up in an event planning session. And... And I couldn't count how many times I sat through a trans support group meeting hearing things about like how women talk and how women act and how women walk and so on and so on. And I remember hearing those conversations and thinking that like I didn't actually have a lot of desire to fit those stereotypes. And that made me wonder at the time, like, am I really trans? Is this really who I am? Uh, I remember hearing stories about uh, about trans women wanting to play with dolls and kitchen toys when they were kids. And the fact that I was happy with my Transformers and G.I. Joes as a kid made me doubt myself. I could go on, but the, the point is, I think we all know there's some pretty exclusionary behavior and attitudes that happen in some circles of the queer and trans community, right? It's something we've talked about on the show before. Recently, one of our guests for this week sent me a message on Facebook asking me about this whole dynamic, and I'm going to let her tell her, her own story here in a minute. But basically, the conversation boiled down to... I'm X kind of queer, but that's not the right kind of queer for some people, so I don't really feel like I belong. And this kind of shit breaks my heart. Uh, we talked for a minute, and, and I started thinking, well, this is a thing we might want to do an episode of the show about. And I made a post on Facebook asking people to share their stories of being made to feel not queer enough or not trans enough, and I was fucking overwhelmed. 
by the responses. This shit is everywhere. And I knew it existed, but being confronted with it and hearing so many horrifying stories, like it made it real in a way for me that might not have been before. Basically, it seems that pretty much anyone who isn't the typical like femme stylish gay guy or the stereotypical butch lesbian with a flannel and haircut to match has been made to feel this way at some point or another. And frankly, I bet we can find plenty of examples of those kind of folks being made to feel this way, too. Why the fuck do we do this to each other? So we invited some friends on the show to talk about what happens, why we think it happens, and how we might combat these attitudes in our community. So Danielle Moscato, Lexi Wittenberg, welcome to the show, dear friends. Hi. Hello. So Lexi, let's start with you. Your Facebook message to me is what prompted this whole thing. So would you mind just sort of summarizing to me what you said? Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically, it all started like I'm a fairly new um, non-believer. I'm fairly new atheist. So I was never exposed to the um, LGBTQ community before. Um, I was always told, you know, it's the devil. And, uh, you know, I was raised Pentecostal, Southern Pentecostal. So everything is the devil, literally. Uh, so recently... You know, I've kind of been exploring and taking some context clues from the past, I guess you could say. And, you know, I've come to the cl conclusion that I am going to admit that I'm bisexual. And I never knew what the letters meant in LGBTQ until like three months ago. I know that's really sad, but <laughs> bear with me. Um, Everybody's new at some point. Don't feel bad. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I realized the B stands for bisexual. I don't know what else it would stand for, but here we are. Uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, I've been more open about it recently. And, you know, Brian, he's very, um, very supportive of literally everything that I do. And I can't appreciate him more for everything he does. But uh, so he was kind of the reason why I'm kind of finally getting out there and admitting and, you know, realizing who I am as a person. So about a month ago, I tried to get in touch with our local um, support or not support, but group um, leader, I guess, for the Chattanooga LGBTQ community here. And, you know, I kind of told her my story and everything. Well, see, here's the thing, though. She's not even she's a straight white female. OK, um, OK, so, hang on. So right. Okay, I'm just going to let... Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. So, you know, I was talking to her about it, blah, 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 and she said, well, you're engaged to a man. And you said, that is correct. Thank you for noticing. Right, <laughs> yeah. And I told her, I said, yeah, well, I mean, if he were a woman, then I would be engaged to a woman. You know, so, like, it's it's... I don't want to, like, I don't know. I don't know, but it really made me angry, and I was furious, and I just stopped talking. Like, I just didn't, you know, say anything. So I talked to somebody else who I know who is in the, uh, who is active in the local community, and she is a lesbian. So, uh, you know, I talked to her about it, and I was like, hey, you know, what do I do? And she said, yeah, uh, I'm not going to say her name on you know, in the open air. But uh, she was like, yeah, she's kind of uh, weird. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, that's that's true as a person, but kind of fun and weird until now. Um, <laughs> and she said, basically, what she feels is bisexual and asexual don't belong. I said, oh. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to burst a vein in my fucking forehead. Sorry. Go ahead. I said, oh, OK. <laughs> Uh, well, so what does that mean for all of us, <laughs> everyone who feels like they should be a part of this, you know, who, who over her definitely reserves the right in the local community. Uh, but people just follow what she says and nobody really notices because well, people like me, I don't really say anything and I don't say anything about it because I've already been told. You know, you're not bisexual enough. So it's like she wants me because I was again, I was talking to my friend about this and she either 
would rather me be in a um, in a relationship with a girl, another woman, or in a uh, I hope I'm saying the word right, polygamous. Yeah, yeah, polygamous yeah. or polyamorous uh, is usually the way it's described. But yeah, okay, you know, a relationship like that with him and another woman. And I said, well, that's not even like. That's totally like, no, these are three completely different things. So I don't understand where she's coming from. She doesn't, I don't think she understands where she's coming from, honestly. I was going to say, and, and this is like, I need to point out here that this is you saying, I'm new all of this. I'm new to all of this. And I'm literally just figuring out who I am. But you, on an intuitive level, get this better than the person who is the like self-styled leader of the community where you are. Yeah. Like, I feel like I just need to point out that that's what's happening here. Wow. Yeah, exactly. How to make people feel safe. Da -na -na. Welcome to the South, y'all. <laughs> My God. Yeah. And, and, and that, I mean, that's a story that we hear a lot, especially when people, because the thing is, when people are, are, are figuring themselves out and you start to get kind of an intuitive sense of who you are, a lot of times that's that's pretty shaky because you're you're coming to the realization that to one degree or another you're a thing that you're not quote unquote supposed to be whether that's queer or trans or i mean even many other things in life so a lot of people come into this very very unsure of themselves and the kind of validation that comes with being welcomed into a community is huge and to be met instead with well you might be a little bit of this thing, but you're not really this thing enough to, to like hang out with the cool kids. Like that's devastating. Yeah, it was. Well, cause, and you know, you always hear growing up, well, are you sure this isn't a phase? Are you sure, you know, you're not going to get over it? Like, well, you're engaged to a, a male, you're in a relationship with a man. So maybe it's just like a, something that you just think about sometimes. And I'm like, no, I would I would fuck the shit out of a woman like Logan. <laughs> <laughs> I can't a relationship with a woman if I wasn't with Brian, to be honest with you. You know, if their personality attracted me and I was attracted, you know, it's just the whole relationship thing, just with a different gender. You know, and it's it's not just a, oh, well, she's really cute or, oh, well, she's really nice. I love her personality. We could be friends. No, it's like a, when I was in high school, I was in a probably a six seven month relationship with a woman and it didn't work out because she ended up being crazy fair fair so <laughs> i mean I, you know i know who i am i didn't want to accept it before just because like you said you know i've always i've been told my whole life you're not supposed to be this um but you know this is who i am and this is who i'm happy to be now that you know i'm not under pressure of all the everything else with the religion and stuff like that but um, you know, just coming out of it recently. And so it's been, it's been a road, it's been a long road and it just keeps getting longer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I ran into that kind of stuff, not necessarily from other people, but from myself. Like when I would, when I would read accounts of trans folks and sort of compare my own feelings and my own story to theirs, like whenever things didn't match up, that was always in the back of my head. Oh, what does this mean? I'm not really trans. Does this mean that like, mm -hmm. I'm just like a, a, a kind of feminine guy? Like, is that what this really is? And, and I mean, those questions themselves are fair questions to ask, right? When you're trying to figure out who you are, because if you turn out to be that, that's okay. But I think the reason that I was asking myself those questions is pretty fucking toxic, right? Because at the yeah. core of it, what I was trying to do is figure out if I was real or not. And like, that's just, oh, that's so the wrong question to ask. The question, the, the real question to ask is who the fuck am I? And like, and, and, I am not one to say we shouldn't worry about labels, but I think labels come second, right? We figure out who we are and then we can work on figuring out a label that makes sense, that, that tells the actual truth of who we are. Uh, yeah. God, that's gross. Okay. Danielle, let's hear from you. I, I've, I've, I've been following your story pretty much since you came out and, and I like, we first started talking not too long after that. And so like, I know this is a thing you have seen a lot of. <laughs> I remember on my article when I came out on uh, Hemet Meta's The Friendly Atheist blog, you left a comment on there mm -hmm. and you said – I'm not sure if that was the first time that you publicly said that you were a trans woman or not. But I remember that you mentioning that and we talked about it later and you said that that was a 
part of the reason that you were able to transition and start to thinking about that. And that's always meant a lot to me. I, I've, I've always respected you for that. Well, thank um, you. I mean, it, but, it made yeah, me feel but, safe because watching you come out and then seeing how so many folks in the atheist community reacted to you coming out. So it, it wasn't coming out because I think I had been out for a while publicly at that yeah. point. But I didn't, that I was, didn't know you yet at that right, point. Yeah. But, it, there, but, but yeah. I, I was thinking about I was thinking about trying to get into activism and trying to become more active in the community and you coming out and the reaction that I saw to that made me feel like, oh, OK, this is a thing that I can do. Like this is it's not necessarily going to be a fight. Like people are interested in having this conversation and talking about this. So, yeah, that definitely mm -hmm. did make me feel a lot better about doing this whole thing. I was listening just now to what you were saying and and these feelings. I mean, it's, what you're talking about is internalized transmisogyny, right? Is this? Oh, uh, yeah. This, yeah. The same ideas that uh, people who are anti-trans have about what trans people are. Let's unpack that real quick. Yeah, Because I sure. think that's a really long phrase that a lot of people may not get. Yeah. So internalized trans misogyny is, I mean, it's trans misogyny in general is just this idea of hating trans women. And so this is really coming from two different groups of people. It comes from conservatives and it also comes from uh, what are called TERFs. Uh, TERF is a trans exclusionary radical feminist. Uh, they're generally liberal. They're generally um, lesbians, uh, although not always. And um, they hate trans women. They don't believe that trans women actually exist and that we're just men trying to infiltrate women's spaces. And uh, so these two groups of people, conservatives and TERFs, um, tend to and, – and there are some liberals who are not you know, technically radical feminists, but they're also anti-trans. It's, it's a – we're getting there. But generally speaking, these two groups of people have a lot of attitudes and they're very vocal about being anti-trans. And uh, they, they have uh, – especially conservatives right now uh, have a lot of political power to reinforce those ideas legally. And um, it, this this concept of trans misogyny filters through people's consciousness. And when you're a trans person, it can really influence the way that you think. Um, as a trans woman myself, I, I get a lot of messages from these people um, telling me that I'm just a man who who is pretending to be trans for attention or for Patreon support. That I'm a that I'm a faggot or you know all sorts of other things and you get you know dozens and dozens of these messages a week and it, they start to influence the way that you think and you start to believe them if you if you let yourself especially if you grow up in that culture I mean I think that's that's really where the the heart of it is is that you know from a from a young age from childhood maybe even from birth um, you're you're raised in this culture that sees transness as a bad thing, as a weird thing, as a perversion. And so even if you do grow up to realize that you're trans yourself, you still have that programming inside of you. And, and really this, this idea that it's a perversion, that it's a, that it's a fetish is, uh, is something that is, that people just don't understand that, that being trans is, is just a state. It's not anything sexual. In fact, I am an asexual person. I, I haven't had sex in years and I have no desire to. I'd be very happy never have sex the rest of my life. And uh, the reason that I'm trans is is absolutely independent of, of any desire to have sex or any desire to fulfill any kind of sexual fetish. That's absolutely nothing to do with that. Right. Uh, and so what we're talking yeah, about yeah. Is, it, is, is the internalization of those ideas. Yes, so exactly. you grow up in this culture that at the very least you get subtle messaging whispered in your ear your entire life about right. what women are what men are and what you are specifically yeah. in that binary and so no matter how woke quote unquote a person you are uh, uh, most of us all of us probably internalize these ideas and uh, and we find it really hard to not apply those terrible ideas to ourselves so that that's sort of the concept that we're describing yeah, exactly. And and it's really it is difficult because especially if you don't fit very neatly into that uh, femme spectrum uh, of if you're a trans woman, you're very femme, then a lot of people push you into questioning whether you actually are trans or not. And, I'm uh, raising my hand. You can't. You yeah, can't see it yeah, because exactly. we're not on video. Same. But I'm raising my hand. Same. Yeah. <laughs> so fe feminine and masculine are, are uh, there's you know there's a spectrum of things and of of the way that people dress and it includes all sorts of stuff as far as your hair length and you know the amount of makeup you wear and what kind 
and uh, what types of shoes you wear and pants versus skirts and dresses. And I mean, it's, it's all sorts of things. It's a lot more complicated than just those things. But um, the long and short of it is that that's a spectrum, masculine and feminine. And, you know, in the middle, you have like tomboys and, you know, presentations like that. But the point that I'm making is this is gender presentation. This is totally different from gender identity. You have uh, you can have women who dress in suits and you can have men who wear dresses and that doesn't change the fact that they're men or, or women respectively. It, it just, it, it has nothing to do with it. And there's a lot of pressure. Uh, and we were talking, you know, at the very beginning, you, you had mentioned um, the reasons for, for why it's like this and, and just getting into the history of it just a little bit. Well, let's hear, before we go there, I want to yeah. hear about your individual experience with this. Okay, sure. So, um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll start with this story, I guess. Uh, when I when I first came out, I was nowhere near ready to start presenting Femme. Um, I, uh, I came out kind of, um, <laughs> I, I'll say against my will, really. I, uh, I got a call from a, a newspaper reporter who wanted to confirm a rumor that I was trans and do a story about it. And I was like, excuse me what (laughs) you're not supposed to know about that um and i convinced him to uh to give me some time to uh, come out on my own and then i would give him an interview if he let me do that um i i wasn't ready i was i had been seeing a therapist for a few months and i hadn't started hormones yet i hadn't started dressing femme yet except a little bit at home and uh it was it was alarming for me and scary but uh I, I talked to Hemet about coming out on his blog, and I did. And uh, that story from from that news outlet came out the next day. But um, yeah, I, I wasn't I wasn't ready at all, and uh, I I didn't actually start um, even going to a trans woman support group uh, until a couple of years later when I moved to St. Louis, Missouri. I was living in New Jersey um, when I came out. But uh, at this trans woman support group, um, I hadn't started dressing femme yet or anything i was still you know wearing the same clothes that i'd always worn and and um and looked the the way that i look which is which is pretty stereotypically masculine and there's there are a lot of people there who were very uncomfortable with that who wanted me to start dressing femme right away and who were willing to help me do that but um it wasn't it was never really a good fit for me. Uh, I'm I'm not super femme, and there's just there's a lot of pressure on on those, uh, on, especially on newcomers to kind of fit into this mold um, of being femme if you're a, a trans woman. And I think the same is true for for trans men, although I can't speak to that experience. Well, yeah, and and there was a lot too because um, l- let me know if this is okay. I'll cut it out if yes, it's not. Sure. No, it's- um, but, but I know there were, there were some medical issues that were, you know, that, that delayed your ability to transition. So like it, it, you, th- there was a, there was an issue of, of readiness, but there was also like a more, more practical, like medical concerns that was like, yeah. you know, even if I was ready to full on 100% do this, like, I don't really, I, I can't yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So I, I have a heart condition. I don't want to take up too much time talking about it, but basically, it's uh, medically unsafe for me to take a full transitioning dose of hormones. I can't do it. Um, if I had a specific, extremely expensive heart surgery, then I might be able to. But in the meantime, uh, I'm on an extremely low dose of hormones, really kind of a token dose, just to make me feel better and to shut up my critics about it. But uh, I, I can't medically transition. It is, it is not something that I'm going to be able to do, and I'm. Hard heartbroken about that and i've i've struggled a lot with that about whether i should even just go quote unquote back to being a man because i can't uh, i will never be able to pass and that is that is something that that hurts me deeply every time i think about it i i almost don't like talking about it because i just start crying there's nothing i can do about it and i'm very unhappy about it but um but yeah that's that's absolutely correct it's just the way that it is and and i don't mind talking about it it's just that it's um yeah, there's nothing I can do. Right. And so you're getting it from both sides of the coin, right? Because you have a group of trans women thinking like, Hmm, this person, this person might be that mythical, like special snowflake for attention because, uh, well, if you're a trans person, of course you want to transition and well, this person doesn't seem like they want to, you know, like I, and, and then, you know, on the other hand, you have all of the people who are actually trolling and, and hating and, uh, yeah, that's gotta be a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had 
I've had self-proclaimed feminists from b- both trans and cis tell me that, you know, if I want people to respect me, that I need to get rid of all my body hair and facial hair and that I need to wear wigs, that I need to wear makeup, that I need to wear dresses and heels as, as though any of those things make me a woman. And they know better than that, considering that they're themselves feminists. And it's just it's just horrible. Well, right. And like, even if we accept that premise, which like I, I need to be clear that we don't. But like, even if we do, we're also saying that in order to become a real woman, you also just need a fuck ton of money. Yep. It's like, very it's very <laughs> privileged stance to talk about this in terms of um, respecting someone's gender based on their presentation, because. Yeah, it's it's extremely expensive to transition. It's not possible for a lot of people for all sorts of reasons, whether it's it's financial or medical or or even just social. You know, I mean, if you're in a if you're in a situation where you're going to lose your job, you're going to lose your family, you're going to lose custody of your kids, you're going to lose, uh, you know, your ability to stay in school or whatever it is. If you come out, you know, people, your friends and and people who know should still respect your gender identity regardless of of your presentation. They're just they're not linked like that. Yeah. Ari, do you have any stories? I have been pretty lucky to mostly avoid this kind of thing personally. Of course, being a non-binary person, again, um, you see, especially trans women, I think, um, kind of pushing back against the idea of non-binary people, which, you know, for people who aren't involved in the trans community, it'd be like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Why are, like, trans women attacking these other types of trans people? But... Um, there, there are some trans women out there who see non-binary people as delegitimizing the trans struggle as uh, being, you know, kind of special snowflakes who want special rights and making a, a big deal out of nothing when, you know, trans actual binary trans people have real issues. And what are these non-binary people so-called complaining about? Um, I haven't had a lot of that directed towards me personally, but I do see that kind of rhetoric online and... You know, there, there's one story that comes to mind specifically that was directed towards me. Uh, this was a long time ago. This was right when I had first realized my identity. Um, so this would, would have been in my junior year of college. I was actually briefly contributing to a YouTube channel for genderqueer people. And every, you know, everyone had their own day of the week and we'd talk about a, a specific topic each week. And I don't remember what the topic was, but this one week I I had made a video and part of the video was talking about how I don't like to be considered feminine. You know, it makes me really uncomfortable when people use feminine words for me and all this stuff and, you know, how I see myself as more androgynous. And somebody commented on the video like, wow, you are super feminine. You're even more feminine than most girls. Like, I can't believe you would say that. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what are you talking about? I just told you I don't like this. And I clicked on that person. Like, I wanted to know who this was. I clicked on their profile and it turns out that they were a trans person. I didn't. I don't know if they were binary or non-binary or whatever, but they, they had a few videos up. I didn't watch any of them, but I was like, what the fuck? Like you're you're coming on another trans person's video and telling them exactly what they said that they don't like to be told as a trans person, what gives them dysphoria. And you're like coming out and talking about that very openly. It made me really upset. And I was just thinking, like, why why would somebody do that? Like, why would you purposefully, especially as a trans person, come on to my content and and leave a comment like that? I wanted to mention something about this thing about non-binary and and trans and uh at the same trans women support group that i mentioned earlier uh, this might be a relevant story there used to be a facilitator in that group who is also a board member of the st louis pride overall and uh, she's no longer with that group and she's no longer representing pride in any capacity actually because she said something about non-binary people very similar to what you're talking about she basically said that she doesn't believe that non-binary is a real identity and that it's a stepping stone to coming out as trans. She doesn't recognize non-binary people as trans and uh, doesn't understand why we have a support group in St. Louis for non-binary people. And I mean, obviously that didn't work well. <laughs> it didn't go over well, but um, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is an attitude that does exist among trans people. There are a lot of trans people that I'm aware of who do not consider non-binary people to be trans. They think of it the same way that like, like a, uh, Christians think of Mormons. They're like, well, you're not Christian, you're Mormon. It's like, uh, you know, but Mormons are like, no, we're Christian too. It's, you know, 
Um, oh, that's a good know, comparison. I hadn't yeah, thought of that like that. It's just it's kind of an interesting thing. I and I, I actually stopped going uh, to that trans women support group and started going to the non-binary group. I don't live in St. Louis anymore, but um, I switched groups like that because the non-binary group, even though I don't identify as non-binary, I am a trans woman. I use she her pronouns. Um, I, but the, the, that group was a lot less judgmental about my presentation and a lot more open to the idea that, uh, that people can wear whatever they want and it doesn't change your gender identity. You are what you say that you are and your pronouns are what they are. And uh, it's just – it's fascinating to me that this is such a widespread problem. I had thought that this was much more localized to that one person in St. Louis and I, I'm seeing now that this is definitely not the way the, – the case. Well, and Ari, you've got a psychology background, so I'm curious if you have any insight into where this sort of stuff comes from. Like, like on the surface, obviously, it seems really counterintuitive, given that, like, if you're a trans person, you probably know what it's like to be shit on for being trans, but you're going to still shit on this other person for being the wrong kind of trans. Or, you know, if, if, if you're gay, you probably know what it's like to be shit on for being gay, but you're like, you're going to shit on this guy for not being the right kind of gay. Like, I, I'm sure it's, you know, in group, out group dynamics, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Do you, do you have any, any insight into that? Yeah. I mean, it really comes down to, I think a sense of threat. I think people, um, they work very hard. You know, if you're in part of a marginalized group, you work very hard to be recognized as who you are and, you know, to have rights and equality as whatever identity it is that you you know, that you consider yourself. Um, and so when somebody comes along and doesn't quite fit that mold, uh, it can feel a little bit threatening because I, I think because you're thinking like, well, I, I have worked so hard, I've sacrificed so much, and this person who isn't a real whatever is waltzing in here and trying to take advantage of all of the work that me and other people have put in. And I, I, I've, I've seen that attitude a lot from trans women, especially towards non-binary people like, you know, trans women are the ones who are really oppressed, which, you know, is true. I think out of all groups of trans people, trans women definitely have the most violence done against them and that sort of thing. And they, they have um, a long way to go in terms of being accepted by broad society. So I do see... I do see where they're coming from in that, but um, I think where they go wrong is that then they don't recognize that this other person is also part of their group. They're not an outside infiltrator. You know, this this person may not experience things the same way you do. They may not experience it as severely as you do. Of course, it depends on the specific case, but um, I, I think they just fail to realize that this person is like me and this person experiences the same struggles that I do. And instead, they see it as, kind of a, a usurper or a pretender or a posal coming in <laughs> and trying to trying to just kind of uh you know delegitimize the whole the whole struggle yeah ever since high school and clicks and emo kids and straight edge kids and preppy kids like i've always been really fascinated with this idea of in groups and out groups and maybe fascinated is the wrong word because it causes so much harm like i don't want to make it sound clinical like these things obviously have very very serious consequences but you know i've always said that I, I don't think people are going to get past in group out group dynamics. I think the idea is for us to expand what our de what our idea of our in group is. And yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I always come back to the story of uh, the, what I mentioned at the at the top of the show where I was talking in the support group about how I was having tr problems with my grandma and things were really rough at home when I was living with my grandma. And she I mean, without hesitation, I've got a spare bedroom. It's yours as long as you need it. Like. That's an unmitigated act of kindness, right? Because we only kind of know each other. You know what I mean? We're not super close, but she's like, yes, you can literally come live in my house. No strings attached for as long as you need to. Like that's an extraordinarily kind thing to offer someone. But this same person in a different conversation where we were talking about, yeah, we should, we should definitely make our spaces more inclusive of non-binary folks. She laughed. Like she didn't like it, she wasn't just argumentative and dismissive. She fucking laughed. And I just what gets twisted in someone's head where they don't understand that that's the same thing, you know, and, and I mean, and I guess you just described it. It's it's the idea that uh, you, the thing that I am is the real thing. And then anything out, outside of that is is either wrong uh, at the at the least or at the most a threat to you know us legitimate trans folks who are fighting for rights to be real and all of that 
fucking nonsense. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I think that there's also I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, if, and if this is too off topic, that just let me know. But I think that there are really relevant historical reasons for why that is. So it used to be, you know, before you could before it was even remotely socially acceptable to be transgender that you had to pass if you did not pass you were going to get killed and right. yeah. and you know so this was a this was a self defense measure for trans people to make sure that they passed and to not even come out unless they were absolutely certain that they could and that that kind of attitude of we have to pass in order to protect ourselves and anyone who doesn't delegitimizes us all, that's still an attitude that really exists, especially among older generations of trans people. Um, this trans women support group in St. Louis that I mentioned, the average age in there was probably 40 or 45 or something like that. And these people, you know, they, they grew up with this idea from their parents' generation especially and, and also in their own generation, that being trans is absolutely not okay. And, you know, if you wanted to work, if you wanted to be in a relationship, if you wanted to just simply walk down the street without getting your ass kicked, that was necessary. And that's that's no longer the case, especially in, you know, the, the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest, you know, whatever. But um, the, the point is, these ideas of, of gender not being a binary is actually a new thing to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, I don't I don't think it's actually a new idea, but that's something that a lot of people are still coming to terms with. And I think that there is kind of this this same idea of um, well, let me put it this way: there is a parallel to the gay rights movement in the '70s and '80s. So when when the gay rights movement was really at its peak, I think, um, there was kind of two groups of gay rights activists. There were the Harvey Milk people who wore suits and ran for office and, and you know, had the option, like bisexual people, of kind of keeping that hidden if they wanted to. They didn't appear gay. Um, that, you know, they, they weren't a visible queer person. And then there were the, the people, you know, I can say this because I'm gay, but who, uh, who, you know, wore assless chaps and rainbow boas and danced on pride parade floats, you know? Right. And so, and, and through bricks at cops, good times. Exactly. <laughs> and the, and the, the Harvey Milk type, and this is nothing against Harvey Milk specifically, but the, the straight laced gay people, the people who were running for office and so on, uh, were angry at these gay pride parade people and saying, you know, you're you're making us look bad. Like we're trying to be taken seriously here. We're trying to get some political power and you're just making us into a joke. No one's going to respect us if they think about us like this, you know? And the gay people who with the feather boas and the assless chaps are like, fuck you. Go fuck yourself. This is who I am. And if people don't like that, I am not the one who needs to change. They need to change. They're the ones with the problem here. And I think that there's a parallel with the trans movement now, uh, trans rights movement, I should say, um, with non-binary people too, that you have a, this trans people who are trying to be taken, quote unquote, seriously who are trying to be quote unquote respected uh, as fitting into this gender binary and then you have people who are non-binary or who just simply don't you know like a trans woman who isn't femme like me or a trans man who isn't masculine um, and are like no you know what I can wear whatever I want it doesn't change my gender and if you have a problem with that you need to change your mind and you know it's society is the one who has a problem with this it's it's not it's not something that I need to change about myself and um, and I think that we're making progress on that. Uh, I mean, it took a long time before it was, you know, socially acceptable for to be visibly queer as a gay man. Um, but uh, we're we're starting to get to that point where it's okay to be socially acceptable, be visibly queer as a non-binary person, as a as a trans woman who doesn't pass, and so on. Yeah, I definitely see that that age gap. Um, you know, most of the non-binary exclusive. Uh, attitudes that I've seen have been from older people. You know, the, the, the younger generation has definitely really embraced the whole concept of non-binaryism, if that's a thing. <laughs> I, I think we just coined a term here tonight. Yeah. I'm into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, I, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. I think it's a concept that once people kind of get embedded into their head, um, it's difficult to break out of that. And I, I mean, people do it. There are plenty of people who are in their 40s and 50s and older who recognize that non-binary is a thing. But 
um, yeah, I, I think it is a generational issue as much as anything else. And I think and it's, I see a lot of sorry, parallels as I'm a pansexual, which is technically, I guess, under the bisexual umbrella, depending on how you define those terms. But um, I'm curious on Lexi's thoughts on this. There are a lot of parallels to here between, you know, gay people and bi people, as as you mentioned in your story, um, you know, the, you, you have your your gay people who are saying, you know, we've we fought for decades to be able to be who we are. And then you have these bi people coming in here trying to take advantage of the work that we've done. But they're you know, they don't live the life 24 seven like we do. You know, if, if they're experiencing discrimination, they can just go date someone of a different gender. So, again, they they feel that that threat like, you know, we we're doing it right and you're doing it wrong because we we struggle more than you do. Yeah, I uh I mean, like I said before, you know, I'm new here. Uh, this is a new school for me. Um, but I feel like a lot of it has to do with, again, like I said before, you know, a lot of people, especially here in Tennessee, have grown up to be taught that, you know, you go through this phase sometime in your life where you think you might like the same gender, you know, stuff like that. So I feel like a lot of that has to do with that mindset and um <clears throat> yeah you know, like it's, it's an experiment you do when you're in college and then you settle back into being normal after afterwards kind of thing yeah exactly and i mean to be completely honest with you this did start out as an experiment in college most here, of this shit does right like that's yeah. cool <laughs> here i am now well, actually high school but like everyone else you know but mine stuck with me you know and um I mean, you know, a lot of stuff, obviously, I don't know a lot of stuff about all this, you know, so I really enjoy listening to you guys talk about it, though. <laughs> but um, I mean, coming from my own personal experience, you know, I think it's um, I know I keep bringing up the South, but I mean, we have Baptists, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know, they have a very strong influence here in Chattanooga. Um but it it. It really, it really sticks with you because, I mean, I grew up my whole life fearing. You know, I feared every single thing that I did. I was like, oh, God, you know, this is going to be, it's going to be, I'm going to have to publicly repent, you know, something crazy like that. And, um, of course, I never did because I never admitted any of it, but whatever. Uh, well, anyway, so, yeah, we're all taught and we're all, I mean, we have a whole, like, uh, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, but it's all the same hardcore, every little thing that you do, you know, you have to be rebaptized pretty much. And um, so it's always been, well, you know, this is a phase and everyone goes through it because at this time in your life, you're the most vulnerable to the devil, you know, stuff like that. And of course I believed it, you know, I've been with it since I was born, you know, so <laughs> the, the preacher knows best y'all. Right. Uh, but I think that has a lot to do with it too, just because again, that's what we're brought up to think. And, you know, our parents, you know, they don't want to believe that their child is gay. They don't want to believe that their child is trans or anything of the, under the umbrella of everything. So, you know, it's, it's really frustrating because nobody believes you. Nobody wants to believe you. And me being only 22, of course they don't believe me. Oh yeah, you're you're young. You'll figure it out when you get yeah. older. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, that that was something that I experienced a lot um you know when I was first realizing my sexuality as a teenager. Um it was the whole you know bisexuality is a phase in between being straight and being gay and and it did happen some in, in my friend group that like somebody came out as bi and then it turned out a few months later oh they're actually gay like because they they were just too afraid to to come out as gay or maybe they didn't even realize it themselves they wanted to they wanted to have some sort of a like i'm gayish but it's not that bad like i could also I'm gayish end up with <laughs> yeah like it's okay mom i could still have kids I'll, you know if i end up with someone of you know another sex or whatever but um, so, so it did, it did kind of have this air when I was g growing up as a teenager of like, if somebody comes out as bi, how long are they going to stay bi, you know? And there's also reasons that people would come out 
as bi, even if it's not a stepping stone to being gay, and, and they're also not bi. Like, just to use myself as an example, I came out as bi when I was 16, and I later realized that I was asexual and trans and homo romantic. So, for people who don't understand all those terms, I'm just going to quickly run through them. Asexual means I have no desire to have sex with anybody. Um, uh, homo romantic means that I am attracted to people of the same gender that is other women uh, in a romantic sense but not a sexual sense and then trans means that I'm a, uh, a woman even though I was assigned male at birth so for me when I came out as bisexual when I was 16 the reason that I did that is because I knew that I wasn't gay I was not sexually attracted to men and I knew that but I wasn't sexually attracted to women either and I didn't really know where I fit in and I knew that something wasn't right but that was about it and I had never heard the term asexual except applied to plants. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand that being trans was a thing. I had never heard of transgender anything. And I, I didn't really use that label for a long time. But if you had met me between the ages of 16 and 18, I would have told you I was bisexual. And it's, it wasn't a stepping stone to coming out as gay for me. Um, but, it, you know, some people use it that way. And, and um I, I think it's, as you were saying, you know, it's important to recognize and believe people when they come out, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what they are. And it is a it is a phase for some people, but not for other people. But you should never assume that it's a phase or, or uh, be condescending to someone as though it is. Yeah. And, and I think there's this idea that experimentation is a bad thing, right? Because I know a few people who have shared with me that they experimented with non-straight relationships and they just had some curiosities they gave it a shot and they figured out it wasn't for them and it's like cool that's awesome like that that, that tells me that you did an honest exploration of yourself and you now know more about yourself than you did before that's awesome and and if you experiment a little bit and you figure out well no actually i am more in the middle of the the sexual attraction spectrum and then later on you figure out like well i'm actually kind of taking a leap together like that's all okay i think uh, it, it comes back to the idea of binaries and that you have to be this one thing or or if you're not this one thing, you have to be this other thing, right? And this is an experience I had when I first came out as trans. The next question a lot of folks ask me is like, well, so you're still attracted to women. So that means you're all of a sudden gay, right? And like I had spent so much time stewing over my gender identity. The idea of my sexual orientation was like, I don't fucking need that stress right now, figuring out that part of myself. But then I thought to myself, I mean, yeah, that it, and it's not that I was all of a sudden that, but I had really been that all along and was just kind of figuring that out about myself. And then I had this really weird experience where I was in the movie theater watching the movie adaptation of The Giver, which I liked and a lot of people didn't different story uh, but, Alex <laughs> but Alex Alexander Skarsgård walks on screen and he is a gorgeous man and I thought to myself holy shit he is hot and then immediately I was like whoa that is a new feeling and <laughs> like wow okay so I guess I'm just attracted to cute people and then I would find myself being attracted to all sorts of variations on androgynous folks and I was like huh I guess I really do just like cute people of all kinds. That's interesting. And, 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 and again, for me, it wasn't the idea of like, oh, I'm experimenting because it's cool and like special snowflake stuff. It was just like I had all of these barriers removed because the, my main barrier to figuring shit out about myself was my gender identity. And once I had that barrier removed, I was able to honestly ask myself these other questions about who I was. And, and, and those things... I know a lot of folks say that their sexual orientation and their gender identity are 100% separate from, from one another. And obviously they do describe completely different concepts, but for me, they were interrelated in that way. And that like, I had to figure out my gender identity before I could figure out my sexual orientation, if that makes sense. And, and, and along the way, back to the, the topic of the episode, along the way, I had all of these things in the back of my head, like, but like, I'm trans, so I can't really be gay, right? Because there was still that idea in my head. I, I I mean, I think everyone still has a lot to unlearn because that's a lifetime of stuff to unlearn everything you're taught as a kid. But I mean, I had almost everything to unlearn at that point in my life. And so I was like, well, if I'm attracted to women, that like I can't really be gay, right? Because I'm like, 
basically a dude pretending to be a woman like that's that's those weren't the words I used in my head but that's the attitude I still had about myself because that's what I'd been taught right and so I even had that like can I even call myself that am I allowed to do that and and then I would go online and I would find all of this discourse about how not only are trans women not real women but like you also can't claim uh, you know, whatever sexual orientation you think you are because of this complication with your gender identity. And like, you can't really be fully this unless you've had surgery or unless you've had hormones or at the least, unless you're pursuing those things. And, um, and I bought into that for a long time because I didn't know any better. You know, I, I did, you just do a search for transgender on the internet and it's not all, it's not all fun stuff that comes up. <laughs> Ari, I want to get to your next question because we've, we've got about 10 minutes left and I think I think this is a juicy one and I think this this will inspire some discussion that's <laughs> worth having. I'm going to call myself out on this question. I'm going to call myself so we, the fuck out so hard. Yeah. <laughs> so we've talked about, um, you know, trans people discriminating against other trans people, queer people against other queer people and us as trans and queer people against ourselves. But I was interested in talking about um, times when we ourselves have fallen into these types of patterns, because I, I know that, you know, no, nobody is perfect. Nobody is immune from this kind of thinking. And we all have this internalized transphobia and queer phobia. So have there have there been times when you have found yourself judging someone for not being trans enough or not being queer enough? And, you know, did did you catch yourself in it? Did you not realize it until later? Are you addressing it? That kind of shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll just I'll just start calling myself out, you know, being being non-binary. And I'm I'm pretty much the the archetype of a non-binary person. Like when people think of the stereotype of, of a non-binary person, they think of someone like me, like somebody who was assigned female at birth and um, is androgynous and has a short haircut and likes to wear T-shirts and jeans and doesn't wear makeup. Of course, there are tons and tons of different types of non-binary people, but uh, that's, I, I think, the type that gets the most exposure. And when people think of non-binary, oftentimes they think of that. And so there have been times, I think, because I'm in this quote unquote privileged position as a non-binary person of being taken mostly pretty seriously on that. Um, you know, when I've come across other people who don't fit that expectation, um, I have been like, huh, what's going on here? Like, I know some people who identify as non-binary but they present exactly like the gender that they were assigned at birth. They might even use the pronouns they were assigned at birth. You know, they dress in a way typical of the person of the gender they were assigned at birth. And in my head, I'm thinking like, how, how are you non-binary? I don't understand. Like, are you, are you just doing it because you think it's cool? And I have to take a step back and, and talk to myself and say like, it's not, it's not my job to tell that person what labels they can use. And even if they present a certain way, again, there's a huge difference between presentation slash expression and identity. So, you know, I, I can't get in their head and judge what their true gender is. It's really up to them to do that. And it's I think it's the safest thing to do is to, again, take somebody at their word and believe them when they tell you that they're something. Yeah, I, I've got a couple examples of this for myself to call myself out. So uh, in this support group, and, and I like, I just, I don't know. I, I feel really bad about this attitude and this is not an attitude I hold anymore. This is something that I have, that I have unlearned and worked myself out of. Uh, but while we're being honest about the things that we have done that we may not necessarily be proud of in this arena, um, there was a trans woman who came to our support group who, um, was the archetype of like redneck guy for, for, by, by appearances. Um, and, um, like super thick hair all over the place and, uh, long beard and wearing a dress. And, um, you know, at this point in my life, I'm like, Hey, you're probably wearing that because that's comfortable. That's fucking cool. It looks good on you. Awesome. Do your thing. What are your pronouns? Cool. Like it doesn't phase me anymore because that's, because that's not what's real about a person. Uh, but I definitely, had this attitude like what are you doing like what what what's this all about you know and uh and, and and again this was at the time that I was figuring myself out and I think I was doing that thing where 
I was, I was like, okay, well, I know what my goals are. And of course, what my goals are in my head is what's real. And this person doesn't fit that. So in order for me to affirm myself, I have to take away from this other person who's doing it differently. And, um, and that's, that was a, a really difficult thing for me to unlearn, to be honest. Um, and then I'll, I'll give a more recent example of this. So I think it was episode 135, the, the Callie's New Gender Feels episode, when Ari and I had this discussion about how I was sort of questioning my binariness about... And I schooled you. I, I got fucking schooled. Um, <laughs> it was rough. She and, left crying. Yeah. She could, probably edited that part out. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, we had discussed in the show that, that I was, I was kind of worried that, that I was sort of being appropriative, that simply because I was figuring out that more and more feminine stereotypes didn't fit me, that I thought that was making me maybe non-binary. Um, and I realized like, I really haven't given an update on the show on what I figured out about that because we definitely left the episode of with me like, huh, I got a lot to think about here. Um, and, and I have come down on the side of honestly, that's where my head was at. And, um, you know, I, I like to think that I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty well-versed and, and, and pretty, uh, pretty non-binary in my thinking, if, if I can, if I can use that phrase, <laughs> and, but, but when it gets right down to it, I think I was just figuring out that I'm not a femme woman. You know what I mean? Like I, I figured out that I really like flannel and I like, you know, I like side shave haircuts and I'm cool wearing men's shoes, but like, that's not the stuff that that necessarily makes someone non-binary and that's not yes it is that <laughs> is what makes you non-binary. <laughs> um and, and and then i eventually had to you know just come down on the side of like i was just i, I was thinking that for what honestly turned out to be problematic reasons and uh I, I am who i've pretty well known myself to be it's just sort of the the outside has changed a little bit the way that i present myself is different because uh you know thankfully four years into my transition now, I feel a little bit less pressure to conform to those stereotypes. Um, and that's, and that's honestly, I mean, that's a measure of privilege, right? Because even, you know, dressed in jeans and a flannel and like no makeup and not doing really anything, but brushing my hair, generally speaking, I'm, I'm red as a woman, like people generally read me as I am. So I, it, it's, it's easier for me to blend in. So it's, uh, so there's less pressure on me. And so I, I kind of had a, a thinking session <laughs> with myself about figuring those feelings out and figuring out that's really where that was coming from. Lexi, Danielle, what do you okay, got? Guess. Call yourselves Still out. Your guts. Let's do it. <laughs> Confess your sins. I still honestly have a hard time with a lot of it just because it's so new to me. And, um, I mean, I don't, I don't really vocalize anything that I'm thinking out loud. Um, thankfully, but, um, you know, I didn't know, um, what that non-binary existed until about August of last year. And, you know, I was 21, went 21 years of my life without knowing what that was. Hey, me too. <laughs> I figured out that I was non-binary when I was like 21. So you're right <laughs> on track. <laughs> well, you know, and it was, um, it was when I met Trav. And that's when I found out that this was a thing. Love you, Trav. Yeah. <laughs> me, of course, I never said it to their face, but it took me so long to get the pronouns right so long and i it just because i read them as a male but and brian always got on to me he was like dude really come on get your shit together and i'm like i'm sorry i'm sorry i just it you know i i didn't know i didn't know you know it, it i went my whole life not knowing that there was that this existed that people um I don't want to use the wrong word, but like we're this way, I guess. Um, I feel like I'm sticking my foot in my mouth, but uh, no, no, you're fine. No, that, Listen, that's perfectly fine. I, I like again, I, I feel like I give off this air that I'm like super advanced or whatever on this stuff. But I mean, honestly, with uh, with with not I mean, I didn't think non-binary stuff was silly when I first learned about it. It was just like, oh, wow, that's new. I had no idea that was a thing. And that's, you know, aside from the fact that I really like Ari as a person, that was also part of the reason that I asked them to join the show, because I think that's an important point of view. And so, I mean, that concept is really only two or three years old to me. So, like, mm -hmm. it's it. 
it's 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 new to a lot of people and i i think the yeah. important thing is like being willing to learn and understand and say well this is who i am and these are my pronouns and the only right answer to that is okay <laughs> well see, you know i've always been such an open person for everybody you know I, i'm so i'm empathetic i'm sympathetic by nature and you know i just i get along with everybody all kinds of personalities you know whoever you are i'm gonna love you no matter what um but it just the the different concepts and the different mindsets and just everything is it's just so new because I'm so used to that uniform mindset. Everybody thinks the same, you know, everybody has the same, you know, concept of, of life and nature and people and, you know, and it just, it just melted away as soon as I met Brian, it feels like, because, you know, he, he opened my eyes and he showed me this whole world that I was completely shut like that my raising completely shut out so you know of course before then of course I was I was super judgmental and I was such a bitch and I felt so bad about it afterwards like after you know seeing all this and and meeting all these people and and seeing how wonderful this is and you know just all this stuff and I'm just like god I'm a dick (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, <laughs> 21 years that's my the first 21 years of my life that was that was me danielle what do you got friend i i don't even know what to say um well i've been trying to think of of an instance where um i was hypocritical on that point and uh, i'm having some trouble coming up with one i'm sure i'll think of one later but um I'm Danielle Moscato. I'm perfect. No, hey. <laughs> no, my uh, my best friend came out as gay when I was in sixth grade, and I I think I've always kind of had a non-judgmental attitude about all of these kinds of things. And um, I didn't grow up super religious, but I became quite religious uh, when I was 21. And even then, even when I was at my most religious. I, uh, that was kind of the major point of disagreement between me and the church that I worked for at the time, um, was that I was non-judgmental about all of this stuff and they weren't. And that's also a big part of the reason that led me to becoming an atheist and eventually leaving religion, um, was that I'm, I'm not judgmental about this stuff. And I think a big part of the reason that it's, it's been difficult for me to, to think negative things about people who don't conform to this, uh, you know, the binary of gender or to uh, being straight as expected by, you know, a quote unquote Christian culture or whatever, is that I, uh, I, I'm personally not fitting in with that either. Uh, I know that I'm trans and that I don't pass. And, you know, it's really hard for me to look at somebody else who's trans and doesn't pass and say that they're doing something wrong. Um, just because I I know that I feel the same way about myself, and I know how much it hurts when people say that, um, and I'm not I'm not trying to you know to say that I'm perfect on this point. I'm sure that I've I've said things that are people have taken as cruel, um, but it, yeah, I, I'm having trouble thinking of a specific instance where I thought something like that about somebody or said something like that about somebody. Well, no, and, and that's okay because really, what I think I think the point of the question is to is to just sort of self reflect. And, uh, and, and just further unpack the idea, um, because, you know, if if we're thinking, you know, if, if we're thinking in the near, in the near past, I mean, it's been, it's been quite some time since I've, since I've sort of let go of that whole, like everything has to be the way that I do things. Uh, and, and that's not to say that I've unlearned every bad idea about gender because I still have them. You know what I mean? I I think it's, it's pretty much impossible to let go of them completely, but I think, I don't know. I, I, I've noticed this thing that Ari likes to do. And and I, I love, I love this because I think it's really, I think it's always really important to examine ourselves and, uh, and and to understand that like, you know, while we're standing up talking about inclusion and inclusion and inclusion, 
uh, you know, no matter how good we think we're doing, it's really, really important for us to step back and reflect and make sure that we are and to recognize any time in our past where we may not have been so we can figure out where the flaws in our thinking were. And, sure. and I think and I think that's really I think that's really what it comes down to is, is just doing a sort of honest examination of that. Ari, am I am I explaining your some might your... call that ideological purity, but yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think really I, you you did understand the, that the point of the question was just for us to realize that we are not, you know, 100 percent woke people that that everyone you know, it's it's like atheists who think that they're skeptical about everything and that everything that they think is is automatically true because they're a logical thinker and they they don't follow religion. They only follow reason. Um, you know, it's the same type of thing. You know, you have to realize that even if you may be in a better off position than some other people are when it comes to queer issues or gender issues or, uh, you know, views on religion or whatever, you're still a human. You're still not perfect. You know, I, I study psychology. Our brains are pretty terrible at thinking rationally for the most part. And we can we can always strive to be doing better at that and be doing better on issues of empathy. Um but we, we do have to recognize that there will be times when we fail and all we can do is, you know, be honest about those times, accept them and try our best to rectify those in the future. I hear it. I hear it. Well, friends, that is all the time that we've got. Lexi, before we go, do you have anything you want to plug? You're, are, are you still doing the Scenic City Skeptic podcast? Is that still a thing? Well, we actually just started it back up after like three months. Nice. So, Tell us where we yeah. can find it. Um, okay, you can go to our website, um, scspod.com. We're on Twitter at scspod, um, Facebook, Scenic City Skeptic, Spreaker, iTunes, Google Play, blah, 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 blah. All the podcast places. All the thing. <laughs> Danielle, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I am on uh, Twitter at Danielle Moscato. I'm also on Facebook at Danielle Moscato uh, dot page. Um, I run a podcast called the Resist Podcast that you can find at resistpodcast.com on Twitter at Resist Podcast, or you can just look for it on iTunes and so on. Um, and I also have a Patreon at patreon.com slash Danielle Moscato. And uh, I've, I'm really glad that you had me on the show. I really appreciate the invitation. I, I always love coming on your show, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you both for coming on. It is greatly appreciated. So to close out the episode, I, I really had planned to do this sort of epic takedown and just sort of like tear apart people who gleefully do this kind of stuff. But like, I'm not really feeling that because gen like genuinely that's not the kind of person that i try to be so um here's my epic takedown if you do this kind of shit fucking quit it you're doing bad things and you should feel bad what i really want to say is is, is i want to speak to you who have been made to feel this way so our queer friends in relationships that have been deemed too straight to count our asexual friends our gender non-conforming friends our non-binary friends friends who don't check off enough of the stereotypes to be considered real in some people's eyes who you are is fine you're valid you deserve to be a part of this community as much as anyone else does you're not wrong. The people who exclude you are wrong. You're more than your clothes, more than your shoes, your haircut, your gay pop culture expertise. You're more than the cleverness of your hot takes. It's fucking heartbreaking to me that you feel compelled to be something different than you actually are just to belong. Who you are is okay. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gatheist Manifesto. We are a proud member of the Trans Podcaster Visibility Initiative. We're a group of trans podcasting badasses working to bring more trans voices into podcasting and other content creation. Search for the Trans Podcaster Visibility Initiative on Facebook for more info. You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto. You can email us at podcast at the Gatheist Manifesto.com. I'm on Twitter at Gatheist Callie. You can find the show on Twitter at the Gatheist. And I bet Ari's got a thing. Callie, guess what? What? I got a doggy. Oh my god! And it's such a cute pupper. Like I am so jealous. She's the best pupper. I'm like, and I'm gonna tell you all about her, so everyone gets to sit here and listen to me go on about how much I love my dog. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you all about her. Her name is Penelope, aka PP, aka PP Head, aka the PP Headed Dog. <laughs> that I don't know why she deserves those names. That's, that's just how she's called. 
She is a Boston Terrier mix. Don't ask what she's mixed with. Nobody knows. Who cares? Oh, crap. Look right behind you. There's a thing happening. (laughs) Uh, She is physically two years old, but emotionally 37. She is a cis girl. Uh, her her religion. I know you're interested in this because we we already have a uh, a neocon living in our house here. Ugh. The name of Tina the cat. Right. Uh, she she is not uh, that. She is a wishy washy Buddhist. She likes the secret. So <laughs> you know we need to work on that a little bit. Um, as far as politics goes, she is really just kind of a hippy dippy liberal. She doesn't pay much attention to most politics. She just wants to know why people can't get along. Uh. Her sexuality, she is mostly straight, but sometimes by curious, especially when she gets tipsy. Her celebrity crush is The Rock. Her favorite music is transcendental meditation and relaxation, but sometimes she secretly binges on Sia and Ariana Grande. <laughs> One thing that she says a lot is, Ugh, girl, you wouldn't believe the day I had. I'm so stressed. I'm just going to pour myself a glass of wine and watch my stories. <laughs> And a few fun facts to close it out. Uh, She thinks jumping on the couch is exercise. She has PTSD just like her Maddie. And she has never seen any movies. Wow. So if you want to see pictures of her (laughs) and hear me gushing about her more on other podcasts, you can friend me on Facebook, Ari Stillman. Email me, ariestillman4 at gmail.com. Um, I'm on the show called This Is Are Getting Out of Hand and also the SJW Circle Jerk, which you shouldn't listen to, except if you're just going to skip to the parts where I gush about my dog. <laughs> if you want to support the show and the activism we do, you can head to patreon.com slash the Gaithys Manifesto and make a per episode donation as little as a dollar per episode. And if you can't do that, you can still head over to iTunes, give us a five star review that helps us get heard by more people because we move up in the rankings. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, you feel like no one cares and no one understands you need to know there's a community out here that loves you cares for you knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love if you're struggling please don't be afraid to reach out until next time friends this is the geekiest manifesto it's it's pitbull she's mixed with pitbull it's a secret don't tell anybody